You spend a lot of time building a voice agent just to realize that it doesn't follow your instruction, it ignores your request, or it doesn't answer at all. These are common scenarios I see every day inside of our agencies with leads that come along and need help. So in this video, I decided to make something really, really special for you. Five rules that actually help you build better voice agents. Now, these are actual insights and tips from us running our own agency, where we build voice AI agents for small and medium-sized businesses up to Fortune 200 clients. So anything you see is actually battle-tested and something we learned, either the simple or the hard First of all, we're going to cover why we are more conversational artists rather than tech experts. Then we're going to cover why you should not overvalue your tech stack. Then I will tell you more on how and when you should prioritize simplicity, which is a really important aspect. Then we come to one of my favorite things, which is that you should not marry your tech stack and I'll explain exactly why. And lastly, it's all about analysis. One of my favorite topics of all, because it is the most powerful thing out there that you should definitely leverage, nevertheless you position you're in. And if you don't know who I am, my name is Janis Moore and I run my own voice AI agency for over one and a half years we have built literally all kinds of solutions you can potentially imagine and these became so successful that we decided to educate other people along it and this is why we founded what we call voice ai bootcamp you'll find that linked in the description below that is for anyone that is really serious about building voice ai agent and it's free so feel free to check it out in the description below it's relevant for business owners and for actual people that want to turn this into an agency just on the side note around a month ago we had a lead reach out to us and complain how we can take so much time to build a voice ai assistant while he quote can build it in rather five minutes now that made me think and brought me to the realization that he might actually be right, at least to a certain extent. But let me explain. Imagine making a tomato soup. Theoretically, I can literally just take boiling water and drop in some tomatoes and can call this whole thing a tomato soup. Now thinking about this, you probably won't really agree because it's not a typical picture of a tomato soup, right? It's something that you would expect something more than just this. But theoretically, it's water with tomato, which can be considered a tomato soup. So there's nothing wrong about that. Or is there? To be fair, I believe that this lead is exactly in this position. You most likely agree with me that this kind of soup is neither delicious, neither does it look good, and it's probably nothing that will make you really happy, right? It lacks the experience of what ingredients to use, at which time to use them, and how to prepare them to actually make a delicious tomato soup. And in the end, it's about the experience of putting all of those things together in a way that makes actually sense. It makes them delicious. It makes them give us the pleasure that we're actually looking for if we order tomato soup, for example. And what might be surprising to you is that it's a very similar concept with voice AI. You can, in fact, build a voice agent in five minutes. That's not a problem at all. The question is, is it actually going to be good? Is it going to be a tomato soup? that's literally just made out of tomato and water? Or is it gonna be this really delicious and beautiful tomato soup? That is a question you gotta ask yourself. Because if you imagine, I can build a voice agent in five minutes. I can build it in probably like one or two minutes. We have predefined things that we actually use for templatizing little demos that we send out. However, this is far away from an actual solution. If you try this voice agent and you build it in five minutes, it talks to you. This is already a lot of magic that happens. So we have people that are not at the level where they say, oh wow, okay, this is already something normal. No, for them it's magic. It's magic that you can actually talk to an AI like to a human. And it sounds great. So they think this is the 100%, this is everything that goes into. But then they actually hear phone calls and they realize, oh wow, it talks gibberish. It doesn't necessarily follow my instructions. It does things that it's not supposed to, or it doesn't answer at all. Like these things, they come from somewhere. And this is the lack of experience of building voice agents. And these things, I can tell you right now, they will not just take a few minutes. They will literally take weeks, if not even month. Now I could go on for hours with this, but you probably get the point now that we are actually in the game of making a voice agent good rather than building the tech itself because the tech nowadays is fairly easy. I mean, there are obviously exceptions to the rule, which is when HIPAA compliance comes in, regulations come in, etc. That stuff we teach in our community. So it's usually not that big of an issue, but where the biggest pain point comes in is actually making it human-like, make it good and follow the script, actually act like a human and fulfill what it's supposed to fulfill, which is getting an outcome or value to the client. And with that said, we come now to our first rule, which is that we consider ourselves more of conversational artists rather than tech experts. And this is one of my favorite points because you have to imagine that we can very, very easily build the tech nowadays. So there's not much complexity in it. If you understand basics about requests, what JSON is, what webhooks are, what APIs are, basically how the web communicates in between technology stacks, this is usually always the same. Nevertheless, the text that you use, yes, there are differences in between, but that is something that's going to be eliminated at some point by even better standards. So it is usually not an issue. Building a voice agent can literally be done in five minutes, but where the magic comes in is making sure that it's actually good. And for that, you need to be really, really good in prompt engineering. I have made 
videos about that on my YouTube channel many, many times, so you can definitely check them out. It is incredibly crucial that you have the proper prompt engineering techniques, that you make sure your prompts are clear, they are well structured, they're not overly bloated, and that you don't have any negative prompt adjustments or prompt fixes appended to your actual system prompt. This is all really, really worse things. And that's one of the biggest tips that I can give you. Make sure that you understand prompt engineering, because that is where you spend a lot of your time making sure that it's actually human-like, making sure that it actually follows certain criteria. And that comes to a lot of different aspects. This means how it actually pronounce words. So you have phoneme boosting that you can do with certain voice providers, how you actually structure the prompt, how it's supposed to interact, the tonality, the persona. All of these are things that you need to define in the system prompt, making sure that it's a robust and solid version of a persona that represents your company or whoever you built this voice agent for. Because in the end, if you wouldn't understand what the heck I'm saying, you would probably not watch that video either, right? You would probably just skip ahead and find someone else that can express meaning better and can probably just share things in a more easy way. And it's exactly the same with voice AI. Why should some client on your phone listen to something that doesn't really make sense to them because it's just not well prompted or it doesn't bring them where they actually want to go. So it's one of the biggest bottlenecks for you to make sure to work out because this is where you can increase the success rate of your actual solution. And if this is still not clear to you, definitely watch it again. You should really, really mesmerize that because it's one of the most important aspects. This is something we go into mostly any kind of call, whether it's discovery call or in any community feedback, anyone gets the same answer towards you being more of a conversational artist rather than a text expert. It just is the fact. Then the second rule is to not overvalue your tech stack. Now this can be interpreted in a lot of ways, but to make it very clear and precise is that you don't want to overcomplicate things. Try to use a tech stack. Mostly any kind of tech stack gets you somewhere if you're not using something that's completely out of place. But to make that clear to you, I'm going to give you an example. Let's assume we're going to build a voice solution on Vapi, and then we want to have something in between to communicate to our external booking tool. And that something in between can be maybe make.com, can be NADN, can be Thoughtly, can be Zapier, can be any kind of workflow automation tool. So which one is the right one to choose? This is something that becomes incredibly hard, especially because of paralysis of choice, because you often can't decide which one to choose because all of them seem to have similar feature and you try to find the best one for yourself. However, most of the time it doesn't matter. It's the exact same with voice providers. Some make it just a little harder than others. And this is where our experience come in, where we can guide you which one to choose. So any solution you choose should be good. And especially when you already have experience with any of them, you should just go for that one. If it's going to be make.com rather than NADN, you should go for NADN. If it is make.com that you have already worked with, then use make.com rather than NADN. It is just something that helps you already get there quicker because in the beginning you anyways just build out your first solution. It doesn't matter if it's 100% perfect. It matters whether or not you get it actually out there and get the feeling of what I talked about, you becoming a conversational artist rather than a tech expert because that's something that just comes through learning it. And I can promise you it doesn't really matter if you use make.com or any then you can achieve very similar results with both of them. The only difference is the amount of time you have to invest into some of those aspects as well as the money that it takes to run them later. So if there's a perfect tech stack I'm going to cover that in another video because there's a lot that goes into it especially how big the solutions are. But generally choose a tech stack that just suits you. Maybe if you already have experience, choose that. If you don't have any experience, just ask around what others are using and see whether or not you can actually just build a solution based on their actual feature set. So don't overcomplicate things. Most workflow automations tools can already tell you that they all can do the same thing. They all do literally just getting triggers and then executing actions afterward. It is literally as simple as that. So don't overcomplicate it. Literally choose one. And if you're in our community, you already know which one you can choose from where we know at least they are all very similar. So you don't get stuck in this repetitive, I'll try and see and figure out what I should actually use and then weeks after you still haven't decided. Then the next rule is how and when you should prioritize simplicity. Because simplicity itself is key for mostly any kind of solution. I've built software before, I know how important it is to make things simple because people love to break things. And they don't even do this actively, it's literally passively. And they usually come to you with complaints, with anger because stuff isn't working. Mainly not because the product doesn't work, but because you just haven't made it simple enough. <laughs> it's literally as simple as that. So what makes it actually simple and where should you put in simplicity? And simplicity again comes always down to prompt engineering most of the time because the tech stack itself is kind of very self-explanatory. There is obviously a little bit of margin. It's usually the last 20% that make the most difference. But apart from that, the tech stack can be very streamlined. The hard part is always getting the prompting right, making sure the things work. So making sure that your prompt engineering skills are laid out for simplicity so you actually understand what makes a good prompt and what you can remove to still get the same outcome or potentially even a better outcome if it comes to flexibility. This is key. And we teach that by doing proper prompt engineering on how to section prompts, for example, you want to use Markdown to enrich them. You want to give certain values to context that is part of the prompt. So you put, for example, a guideline section, you put a persona section in the persona section. What information do you add there? If you add variables, how do you structure the variables? I can give you a really cool example there because lately we had a lead come to us with the need for having a prompt set up in place that focuses on five different industries and all five different industries have different scripts. And he tried to merge all of them into one big prompt. So you can imagine it was a mess and it was completely hallucinating on mostly any corner you can possibly 
possibly imagine. So what did we do? We first of all tried to figure out if there's an outline, if there's a structure behind it. And guess what? There was a structure. Mostly all of those scripts were kind of similar. The only thing that differed was the questions they were asked. Even the outcomes were the same. Rather than us trying to push in five different scripts into this prompt and try to give examples, etc., we just created an outline. So basically a skeleton of that script, which is basically more of a reference rather than the exact instructions. And then we just use those dynamic questions as variables that we can feed into the prompt. This helped us to make it really, really dynamic and have at least five times less text in the prompt. And you can imagine that this immediately increased the quality and the outcome of these prompts by quite a lot. So this is a way on what I mean with simplifying your prompt. If you want to make your prompt better, it's usually by not adding more to it, but by removing or rephrasing something. This is really one of the most key aspects. So in case you ever encounter that something hallucinates in your prompt, please do not add or append anything to your prompt that tries to fix that issue because in the end it makes things worse because it confuses it and it's most likely at a part where it's not supposed to. So I have videos on my channel where I explain about what, how you can use reasoning for figuring out what a prompt does, how you can optimize that. If you'd like to see a full tutorial on that where I really go in depth on how you can really, really optimize your prompting and make sure that you actually get a shorter or a more simplistic version out of it, feel free to comment it below. I'm very, very happy to dive into that. Another one that actually originates out of overcomplicating things is don't marry your text stack. It's one of my favorite ones because I always see people struggle a lot with choosing the right text stack. Like initially we talked about what is the right text stack. You can literally spend hours just on that and trying to figure out, go through this paralysis of choice, trying to see which tool is the actual right one for you. But don't marrying it means you already won or even multiple steps ahead. You already built a solution. You potentially delivered that already, but now it's out there. Now the client wants to have adjustments. The client would like to have extra features. How do you implement that? Is it something that you can still do with the current text stack? Is it something where you need maybe something more sophisticated? Let's for example say you build an MVP, so a minimum viable product, right? Something that they can use that is covering the basics, but it's not there to be a full and readily deployed solution. Where do you put the stuff after? Once it's, once it's proven, once you actually have something that works well, how do you actually incorporate that into a better structure? We, for example, had a big healthcare provider where we built out an MVP on a more no-code slash low-code platform so we could trial and see how well things work. And when they saw the value of it, we actually started migrating stuff to a completely different platform. And trust me, this is perfectly normal. It doesn't mean that once you have chosen a tech stack, you need to stick with this tech stack. And it becomes generally very, very hard if you do that and usually even detrimental because your clients might leave you because you simply cannot keep up with implementing features because you're using too many tools that seem good out of the box, but then they're very limiting. So you try to advance stuff and move things out, bring in new tools, push others out, maybe set up new subscriptions, maybe already use the existing tech stack, which is often the case as well. So with those healthcare providers, we, for example, start hosting things on AWS. So you have a whole custom setup where you can start implementing things once it actually gets serious. All of this is part of the journey where you really need to understand that you need to stay agile. You need to just have the possibility of switching tools at the right time when it's necessary. Now that sounds like a big task, but we've done that multiple times. So we can tell you which ones usually become relevant at which point. And obviously if you have at least this baseline where you say, okay, this tactic is great. You can delay some of those aspects to a later point or potentially use already what you have and just take it from an open source solution like NADN, for example. We often have it that people start on the cloud version of NADN because it's very easy to set up and build in. But when they actually get serious and they need HIPAA compliance or they need higher data privacy setups, then we can even pull this over and just migrate it completely to AWS, have it run on their own machines so the data doesn't even leave their own ecosystem. So that's something that's possible and very, very normal. So don't marry your tech stack. It just means that you should literally just have an agile mindset, be able to switch things if it's time and you will feel that because you will feel pain by not being able to implement some of the features as quickly as you potentially want because some of the tools are just limiting. And then the last one, which is probably the most lucrative one of all, given you following the previous ones already, is analyzing your data. And not just analyzing it, but actually using that data as well. This is something that we don't really like to do. I know because it's a very boring job, it's not fun, but it is something that brings you so much value. You can literally not even put it into words. Understanding how well your solution works, not just helps you to understand how much value you brought the client. You also know how you can place your next offer. You also know better how that affects people in your company if you build it for yourself. You already know how it impacts other people out there. All of this information is so relevant for A, you structuring a better offer, making your voice assistant better, seeing where there are still bottlenecks, seeing how well it performs and where you can improve it. It is literally something that needs to be there. A voice agent nowadays is not just a one-time project where you build it off and that's it. It's still something we promote, but most people know and they feel it as well that it is something ongoing because you just need to have the support aspect after it or help your team to make 
make sure that the voice agent actually works really, really well at any given time. Because in the end, if you don't monitor it, you don't know how much money you lose. You don't know how well the AI actually performs. You don't know what you can improve to make things better. All of those aspects are incredibly important and you can really just build out systems that help you with this. Now I've talked about this on my channel before. Let's take Langfuse, for example. It is a tool that you can use to analyze what actually happens inside a call. And not just that, you have what we call traces. So basically single turns of every single phone call where you can debug things, where you can see how well they work. You can run success valuations on top of your calls, see how well the outcome was. Did the person actually book something? Did the person actually buy something? Are they qualified? These are all questions you can just literally analyze with the data that you have. And all of them become really, really critical when you try to understand how much value you provide. How many minutes of phone calls did you automate? You can calculate this up to a yearly basis and just compare it to the performance of a normal human. And then also given that a normal human doesn't need breaks, they don't need to have insurance. These aspects really just enable you to understand this whole concept. And one thing that I like to mention, because I know these things, they often sound like we want to replace humans. It's quite the opposite. Replacing humans is not even the thing that we target. We, we don't ever target that in any kind of outreach method. So when we talk with clients, it's mainly enhancing them. Because if we, for example, look into dentist office, we noticed that they actually like their front desk or they like their stuff, their family. They're kind of like family pretty much. So making sure that they have a better work environment is super crucial for them. So let's imagine now we actually help them to get more free time, to not stay on the phone and actually talk with angry people, try to get an appointment book because that's something AI can take care of. It's only for those critical cases where a human needs to be involved, which again, just helps your employees to stay more focused, but also helps them to be happier because they don't need to deal with so much stress on the phone, which is completely unnecessary. So you just enhance the functionality, which can be used in other parts of the business. So analyzing data becomes incredibly crucial and it's a whole thing for itself. But if you don't do this, you're really missing out on so much, I can't even put it in words. So I know that all of this is a lot of information and it's probably really, really a lot to process. And even though I have touched so many of them, they're all on a pretty basic level because all of them can go very, very deep, but I wouldn't just have the time to explain all of this in depth. So if there's any of them that stand out and that you really want to understand more, feel free to drop me a comment below. I'm very happy to make an in-depth tutorial about them because in the end, I want to make sure you actually deliver something valuable. I want to make sure you know how to build great voice agents because I want this industry to grow. I want people to actually understand how much power lies in those solutions. And we are so early in this game that all of this is going to be an incredible opportunity for the future on making more money and being at the forefront of the greatest tech shift of our time. So if you found this video valuable, I'd love if you can give it a like. And thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate your time. I can't wait to see you in the next one.